What we're going to do is talk about a topic very, I think, timely. How safe is your cycle and how safe is your saddle? And I think that kind of gives an overtone, uh, a little bit maybe negative of cycling, and I definitely don't want to do that. So there's lots of benefits to cycling. Certainly there's no question there's huge aerobic benefits. Um, it can increase lipid profile, certainly very fun and relaxing. And these graphs here demonstrate the mortality benefit to extreme physical activity. And both of these studies, both of these graphs show in men and women about a 50% benefit, mortality benefit. But there's also inherent risks uh, in cycling. I think we certainly see that here in San Francisco. And these, these graphs demonstrate injuries and then hospital admissions from uh, bicycle accidents over the past about 15 to 20 years. But we're gonna talk about one of the more hidden risks, and that's to uh, sexual function. So first, let's start with definitions. So what is erectile dysfunction? Well, I think similar to pornography, I think most of us would say that we can spot it when we see it. But to define it, it's the consistent or recurrent inability of a man to attain or maintain a penile erection sufficient for sexual activity. And it certainly can have profound effects on a man's quality of life and his partners as well, his sense of self, and his overall health. So how do erections work? Well, let's look at a penis in cross-section to see that. So on the left, we have in the flaccid state, and on the right, in the erect state. So in terms of anatomy, we have the erectile bodies, or these paired structures here. The urethra's on the bottom. Most of the nerves, arteries, and veins are here on the top. And there's obviously some other arteries and veins throughout. And essentially, what happens during erection is you get this neural stimulation, which causes dilation of the arteries to bring in a lot of blood. And you can see that huge expansion in the erect state. So then how do we measure sexual function? Well, there's validated questionnaires for both men and women, you know, looking at states of arousal, erection. We can also measure tissue oxygenation directly in genitalia, and Roger's gonna talk a little bit more about that. There's selective imaging we can do, and you can actually assess some of the, uh, the neural signals. So you can look at tactile vibratory sensation in relevant areas. So then how common is erectile dysfunction? So this is data from the Massachusetts Male Aging Study. Um, really one of the landmark studies that taught us how common, how prevalent erectile dysfunction is. So you can see for men over the age of 40, over half of the men in the United States have some form of erectile dysfunction. So it's very, very common. So then what causes it? Well, we already learned from the picture that it's, uh, again, it's a, a, a process that involves blood flow. So certainly vascular uh, blood vessel issues can cause it. There can be neurogenic uh, diseases of the nerves. Hormonal issues, medications can cause it, as well as penile injury and disease. And this has kind of been recognized for a while. So this is a quote from Hippocrates that recognized that trauma to the perineal area over 2,000 years ago may affect sexual function. So if you'll bear with me, I just want to read this. And he's talking about here men in the upper class. So their bodies grow fat and squat through their sedentary lives. A constitution of this kind prevents fertility. The men have no great desire for intercourse. Moreover, the constant jolting on their horses unfits them for intercourse. Such are the causes of barrenness in men. They are personally fat and lazy. This affliction affects the rich Scythians because of their riding, not the lower classes, but the upper, who possess the most strength. The poor who do not ride suffer less. They do not handle the parts, but owing to cold and fatigue, forget about sexual passion, losing the virility before any impulse is felt. So this is really some powerful observations. I think we're seeing here effective obesity on sexual function, but also this constant um, perineal trauma from saddle injury. So why would that occur? Well, let's look at some uh, photos of uh, the anatomic structure of the penis. So on the top, we're looking at the blood supply to the penis, primarily through the internal pudendal artery, which then branches to the other kind of the main uh, named arteries of the penis, and then also the pudendal nerve on the bottom there, and that serves to innervate the penis. And so these turned out to be uh, at risk uh, during cycling. So if we look at the, the pelvic structures here, when you're sitting upright, all the weight should be on the ischial tuberosity right here, and that's right here. But as you kind of lean forward, if you're on your saddle, if you lean forward in the arrow position, all the pressure is going to shift here to the flat portion of the pubic ramus. And that's actually where the course of these pudendal artery and nerves are. So we're looking here backside, looking forward. This is the, blood's, this is the penis here. But you can see the pudendal artery here on each side. And you can imagine here, this is the, the flat portion of the pubic ramus. If you're leaning forward, that's going to be, it could potentially compress that artery and can impact blood flow. And so let's talk about then the history of erectile dysfunction as it relates to cycling. And I'm going to turn things over to Roger.
Thanks, Mike. How many of you are cyclists here? So that's why you're here, of course. <laughs> so uh, I got involved with cycling in 1997. This is the article from Bicycling Magazine, August 1997. And in that uh, magazine, there was an article about um, erectile dysfunction and sexual dysfunction. And it was really the first time in the cycling literature that this was brought out, uh, out into the open. Uh, Erwin Goldstein was a urologist, famous urologist in Boston, and came out with what many people thought was way too strong a, an opinion, but said that he thought that cycling was uh, too dangerous. He estimated over 100,000 men in the United States alone would be, have erectile dysfunction as a result of cycling and compression of the internal pudental artery. At that time, Goldstein was doing um, arterial bypass uh, to try and correct this condition. So he was the guy in the United States where everybody went if they had the problem. So a lot of people thought that his opinions were uh, based on the fact that he was seeing all the people with, with problems and not the normal population. This story went all over the world, and so it was huge. It went uh, all over the United States, Europe, Asia, Men's Health, um, Playboy, everybody was writing about this, uh, this issue, and the bicycling um, uh, industry was starting to panic. At that time, I, uh, I was working on a different kind of medical problem, but I read the article in Bicycling, and I went home and started cutting up bicycle saddles, and um, I sent a saddle to the editor of Bicycling Magnet that wrote the article, or wrote the sidebar. And I said, look, here's, a, here's a, a seat that might might help you. And all I did was cut out the center section and relieve the pressure so that when you sat on the bicycle seat, you didn't compress the internal pudental artery. So I just removed that V section in the middle, and I sent it to this guy, Ed Pavalka. And um, a week later, I got a call from Mike Sinyard, who owns Specialized, and he said, would you come and help us make saddles? So we started with the first saddle in... Um, it, it took a year to get out into the, into the marketplace, came out in September of 1998. In the first year that we made that saddle, we sold 500,000 of them. It was the biggest selling bicycle product in the world. And it changed um, everybody's viewpoint as far as making the rider comfortable. Before that, everybody said, if the rider's not comfortable, it's their problem. They're not training enough. They're not tough enough. But when this saddle came out, 500,000 of these saddles came out. Everybody said, wait, we want to get, we want to get on board on this and make the, the riders more comfortable. So this was sort of the birth of ergonomics uh, for bicycle riders. Um, now Goldstein wasn't the only guy that was uh, concerned about this. And there, was, there were other people that were doing studies. So it was easy for the bicycling community to uh, dismiss Goldstein and say, look, this isn't really a problem. But in Europe, um, there was a study done at the Great Tour of Strength in Norway. And the, the Great Tour of Strength is a 15-hour ride from Trondheim to Oslo in the summer. And in the summer, the water bottles freeze when they go over the, the top of the mountains. Um, I went up there to, uh, to ride along with the, the Great Tour of Strength and do a uh, study on saddles when we came out with our first saddles. And um, the rate of uh, erectile dysfunction was quite high, and it was indisputable at that time that, that cycling was causing real problems. So this questionnaire, along with some of the others, um, sort of validated the fact that 20 years ago, cycling was dangerous, and erectile dysfunction was a real problem. Um, Frank Sommer is a urologist in Germany. He's the first professor of men's health, or was in the world. Uh, he started out in, in Cologne, then went to Hamburg. And um, Summer did the largest study ever done, which was a survey uh, between cyclists and non-cyclists. And he measured the rate of erectile dysfunction and found that uh, cyclists had basically twice the rate uh, when you stratify them for their age groups. So Summer's study was in incredibly important because of the size of it. He had 7,000 people. What he did was he said, OK, um, We've got erectile dysfunction. Where does it come from? How does it, how does it work? There was another study done by a guy named Moreland. And Moreland uh, actually biopsied the penises of cyclists. And he found out that the more somebody rode, the more scar tissue they had. And he hypothesized that the scar tissue was creating a situation um, 
that led to fibrosis and erectile dysfunction. Summer then was the first guy to measure uh, penile blood flow while somebody cycled. And he published this in around 2001, 2002. Uh, he used transcutaneous oxygen measurement, and, and he could see the difference between um, narrow saddles, wide saddles, sitting in a chair like you are, uh, sitting on a couch. So I went to see him in his lab in Cologne, Germany. And we measured the blood flow on all the saddles that I was designing. And then I started redesigning the saddles and cutting sections out. And we would remeasure the blood flow over and over again until we found out exactly what sections needed to be removed to increase the penile blood flow. Uh, this guy was our tester, Marcus, a fantastic guy. Uh, nothing shook this guy. He was amazing. We did a live TV show in Frankfurt, and the machine wasn't working, and everybody was panicking. And uh, Marcus said, everybody, please leave the room and let me just be alone with this machine. We came back. It all worked. Marcus was absolutely unflappable. Nothing bothered him. Uh, Measuring uh, penile blood flow. So this was a real problem that I had for many, many years because we couldn't show the penis. I actually, I, one time I went to a sex store and I, I said, look, can you give me something that I can use for my lectures? And they gave me this big, big glass penis with veins all over it and stuff. And it was about this big. And I went, we can't do that. And so I went to, to work and I said, look, we've got to have some way of showing people how this transcutaneous oxygen machine works. And uh, the guy that was my um, tester, Lucas, was eating a banana. And I went, the banana is going to work. <laughs> and so um, from then on, we used the banana. And you can see that the oxygen monitor is taped to the, to the banana. Actually, the banana had a pretty decent oxygen, actually 39. <laughs> Not bad. And um, so this is a transcutaneous oxygen machine. Every hospital uses these for things for um, burn victims. So they put uh, the probe on an area that's a graft, for example, and they want to see if the um, arterial flow is good enough for the graft. And that's what this machine is used for. But some are actually used on the glands of the penis and started measuring um, all sorts of saddles. This is now back 2001, 2002. Um, so he published a lot and uh, was, became very uh, famous. This was a graph that he had, and it showed that the rider, uh, if the rider would uh, stand up, the oxygen would go up, and the oxygen is, is paralleling the blood flow. So he, he measured the, uh, the uh, oxygen levels when the rider was sitting, when they stood up over long periods of time. And... Um, at that time, when, we, when I went to the lab with Frank, there was no concept of bike fit. So every one of our riders was on the same bike, same size bike. There was no adjustment for top tube length, no adjustment for handlebars, uh, and there was no adjustment for the saddle was always flat. So it was rather primitive in those days, but it was a, it was a beginning. The magazines in Germany especially uh, measured then, because they were very interested in this, they measured blood flow on every seat we could find. And um, here what we can see is that there was a problem with the test, because uh, we didn't know this at the time, but these things are going over 100% blood flow. So that means that these, these riders would appear to get greater blood flow riding on their bike than they would standing next to it before they got on. And that never happened. But uh, what did happen was that we learned that the baseline of the machine would continually change. And in these days, we didn't account for it. But later on, when we were doing more sophisticated tests, we would measure the baseline first and then the blood flow so that it was all um, consistent. All right, so we'll look at a few more studies then about factors that can impact sexual function in men. And this is another study from the Massachusetts Male Aging Study done here in the United States. And what the investigators did is uh, divided the group into cyclists and, and men that didn't cycle. And so when we look at the men on the, the left column here that didn't cycle, you can see about 20% of these men reported erectile dysfunction. However, then they divided the cyclists into groups that cycled less than three hours or more than three hours a week. And what we see is that as a whole, that group had lower rates of erectile dysfunction, which you would expect because these are healthy, fit men that ride you know, quite a bit. 
But what we see is that in the most intense group, the group that cycled more than three hours a week, there was actually a higher rate of erectile dysfunction than the group that cycled a little less. So it suggests that maybe moderate cycling could be protective, but intense cycling may actually worsen uh, erectile function. So this is sort of recreational riding. So another group at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, looked at men that are exposed to riding for work. So a good group uh, to study here would be bicycling patrol officers. So they looked at 17 patrol officers compared to five non-cyclists. You can see they rode for about five hours a day. Interestingly, 90% of these men experienced groin numbness. But also importantly, neither of these, none of these men actually had erectile dysfunction when, it was, uh, when, they, when they queried them. However, they looked a little bit more closely at functions of penile health. And they did what's called nocturnal penile tumescence testing. So what this is, is you can put a device around the penis, and when we sleep, we get erections. And this device can then measure how many erections we get, how rigid it gets, how long they last. And then that gives us some idea about how well blood circulation is in the penis. And so if we have on the top the patrol officer, on the bottom the control subject. And when we look at these, these black um, uh, areas, the higher they are, the longer they are. That's sort of a longer, fuller erection. And you can probably convince yourself the control subject seems to have better quality erections at night than the patrol officer. So it's not a perfect study. And again, clinically, it may not make that much of a difference, given the fact that none of these men reported erectile dysfunction. But it suggests we're seeing some differences. So kind of looking a little further, this group then wanted to look more at its saddle, similar to some of the work that Roger had, had been doing. So there's certainly a lot of saddles. I took this picture a few days ago just walking around Stanford. In less than a minute, I saw probably about 100 bikes. And not surprisingly, I saw about 100 saddles. And they come in all different shapes and sizes, everybody knows. Uh, also different levels of wear, apparently, as well. And this group looked at perineal pressure from the different saddle designs uh, and actually showed some significant differences. So based on how weight is distributed, you can see significant differences in pressure. Uh, some of these saddles had significant higher rates of perineal pressure, and they actually correlated even with blood flow and saw uh, significant impairments in blood flow with some saddle design. So again, kind of getting in this concept that not all saddles are, are equivalent. Now, up to this point, we've been talking just about men, but what about women? Well, some of these same principles apply to women, but we have far less data. So Roger and I have told you about thousands of studies that have been done on men, so there's very, very few done on women. But this is really one of the pioneering studies by Marcia Guest and colleagues. So she looked at 48 female cyclists, then compared them to tw she compared them to 22 runners. And you can see some of the characteristics about how much they rode or they ran. But one interesting statistic is that of the, the cyclists, 63% reported genital pain, numbness, or tingling. And that was very rare in the running group, just 5% of those men. Furthermore, this group went on to study uh, sensation a little bit more closely in the genitalia, looking at vibratory sensation. And, and they reported significant differences here, significant decreases in vibratory sensation in the genitalia of these cyclists compared to runners. Furthermore, they looked more at seats and again saw differences based on saddle design, which we've heard about. And also looked at overall uh, cycling position. And here, handlebar below the seat is associated with increased perineal pressure, which I think makes sense. Again, as we lean forward, we get more perineal pressure. So again, kind of giving more credence to this idea of fit and body position being very important. So if we summarize kind of the, the current state of affairs, and this is, again, probably about 20, 15, 20 years ago. For studies of men, there seemed to be an association between riding and sexual function. Also, saddle design, position, can alter blood flow, uh, sensation, and perineal pressure. And limited studies in women showed this the same thing. So now I want to talk, turn it back over to Roger. He's going to talk about some changes the industry made. So 20 years ago, uh, it, it was easy to measure differences in saddles. And if we measured blood flow from one saddle to the next, we could, we could tell that one was uh, much better or much worse than the other one. But as time went on, as the years went on, it was harder to measure this because the saddles changed. And the industry adopted a couple of uh, design changes that made it a lot safer for the riders. Here's a dome-shaped saddle. And this, this is like a 130-millimeter saddle 20 years ago. Uh, would have been 
sort of an average size. Uh, there was no widths at that time. Uh, and the, the saddle was quite dome shaped. The, the tour riders, all of Peloton, were riding similar shaped saddles. Uh, but what happened over the years is that the saddles flattened out and got wider and the center um, section of the saddle became a relief section somehow, either, either a groove, a hole, uh, different foam densities, but something in the middle then would relieve the pressure. So the internal pudendal arteries are gonna run right around here on both sides, and by relieving the center section here, you've relieved the, the pressure so that the more blood flow could flow. The other thing that happened was that if we, if we look at the arteries here and the nerves down here, here's your dome-shaped saddle in the old days. Uh, hopefully it's the old days and you guys aren't still riding this stuff. And then um, as the saddle uh, grows wider and the relief comes in, the pelvis lifts up because as the wings of the saddle uh, aren't so dome-shaped, then the, the pelvis can lift up. It relieves the pressure on the internal pudendal arteries and uh, nerves and creates a much safer position for, and uh, situation for riders, both men and women. We're talking about men here because we can measure uh, penile oxygen, and we never could measure the oxygen on a woman when they were, were riding, uh, but we know that the internal pudendal arteries run in the same course in the pelvis. It stands to reason that they have the same problems. Uh, Marcia Guess's study in, uh, in Yale probably had something to do with arterial compression and nerve compression in the same way that we were seeing it with the men. But the biggest difference over the last 20 years is bike fit. And um, bike fit's been around forever. A long time ago, the Italians wrote manuals about bike fit, but what it was, it was individual uh, brilliant uh, cyclists who could then fit people in their own method. There was no, no consistency. It wasn't until, um, well, uh, 2002, we started with widths of saddles, and the saddles have grown um, from an average of maybe 135 millimeters to an average of maybe 155 millimeters. So saddles have gotten much wider, and as the saddle gets wider, your sit bones, your ischial tuberosities are supported better, you're, you're lifted up, and your arteries are protected. Um, bike fit uh, is an incredibly important variable now. The problem is, is that there's no real definition of bike fit. So there are different methods in the world. Some of them uh, are large uh, systems like the specialized method or retool, but some of them are individual people uh, fitting people and there's no real uh, measure of what works and what doesn't. We understand that bike fit's very important. We can measure the difference in the blood flow uh, with somebody who's been fitted and somebody who hasn't. If we even tip up the saddle 10 degrees, you'll lose 70% of your blood flow. So we know that bike fit is very, very important, but we need definitions. And uh, the study that Mike and I are doing, what we're trying to do is be much more extensive in the cycling side. So, so we have uh, detailed descriptions of saddles, riding styles, stuff that nobody, nobody's ever really talked about before. So that when you fill that questionnaire out, if we get enough people, we can actually correlate uh, certain methods of bike fit, for example, with uh, medical disease uh, and, and what seems to be better and what isn't. But we need thousands of people in the study to do that. So far, we've got about uh, 1,500 people in the study. We need 10,000. We need your help to um, uh, not only fill out the study, and it's, uh, it's on the bottom there, cycle.stanford.edu, but to, to let all of your riding friends know to fill it out so that um, we can you know, collect enough data that when you walk into a bike shop, we can tell you what's gonna be safe and what isn't. So for example, if you're, if you're looking at a 130 millimeter saddle and it's dome shaped and you measure your sit bones and they are wide, we know that that saddle is gonna cut off your blood flow. And we need to be able to uh, protect the riders and let them know. So whereas uh, the saddles right now are safer than they have been in general in the past, there's still problems out there that were not defined. So what we're trying to do on this study now is go much deeper and define these things so that we can change the industry and uh, give the cyclists the information they need to stay safe.
All right, so we began with some of the older studies. Now we're going to talk about uh, two of the more uh, <coughs> modern studies. So the first one was done in the UK, the Cycling Health for UK study. It's an online survey of about 5,000 men. You can see it was done about five years ago. ED was assessed by just self-report, simple yes, no question. And so the table here shows weekly cycling time uh, on the leftmost column. And you can see as we're going down the column, or going down the rows, rather, we're having more cycling hours per week. And then on the rightmost column, we have the percentage of men that reported erectile dysfunction. And what you can probably notice is there's not large differences there, right? It doesn't seem like as men report more uh, riding, they're reporting more erectile dysfunction. So suggesting there's not a strong association here, at least in this study. Now here's another study. This is done uh, right here at UCSF, also an online study, comparing cyclists to non-cyclists. And they didn't want active men, so they had runners and swimmers. They divided the cyclists into high intensity and low intensity. You can see based on duration um, and the amount of uh, cycling done per week and per day. And then they looked at some validated questionnaires to assess uh, sexual function. So they had about 2,000 high intensity cyclists, about 1,000 low intensity cyclists, and another 1,000 <coughs> non-cyclists. And so then what did they, what did they find? Well, on the top, we have the, what's called the SHIM score, which is sexual health inventory for men. That's a summation score of sexual function, one of these validated questionnaires. And essentially, there's no difference between any of these groups. And on the bottom, we're looking at it graphically. So we're looking at different quintiles of lifetime uh, miles ridden on the different columns. And each of the different color represents uh, a different uh, kind of metric of sexual function. So the blue here is men with no erectile dysfunction, and as we go up, erectile dysfunction increases so that this aqua color here is men with severe ED. And then again, as we're increasing the riding amounts, there's really not strong differences, right, between these groups. It's hard to convince you that the group uh, on the right is any different than the group on the left. But one thing they did notice is that uh, perineal numbness definitely increased the more riding that was reported. In addition, they did notice some differences with equipment. So there were certain factors that did associate with higher degrees of perineal numbness being reported. So I think our riders safer now. I think there's some studies that suggest that that may be true. And I think why that is, again, maybe that the, uh, the industry took notice and did a lot of redesign in terms of fit as well as saddles. But I think there's a lot of unanswered questions about this as well. And that's uh, the rationale behind uh, Roger and I doing this, this cycle study, the Stanford cycle study. So again, everybody is invited to participate takes about 10 minutes. Maybe some people already did. And there's even a chance to win a gift card. And the idea behind this is we want to find out you know, what causes uh, dysfunction, who's at risk, and how we can really make riding safer for everybody. You know, we look at a lot of different factors. Certainly, we, we do extensively look at saddles based on some of the hypotheses that we've showed you today. Um, but we look at lots of other factors as well. And you know, our goals are to try and you know, again, make riding safer. And we have found some interesting things. So we actually show that uh, for both men and women, perineal numbness and genital numbness early on in a ride, like within probably the first 30 minutes to an hour, if you experience that, you're much more likely to experience sexual dysfunction as well. So a lot of times I think, you know, we'll, we're taught to sort of push through some of those things, that it'll get better, it'll work itself out, but it may actually be a warning sign. And so Again, if that turns out to be validated as we get more data in, uh, that may be a time to think about getting a new saddle, getting refit, maybe making some changes uh, to try and make a riding safer. So again, our goal is to try and do this, but we really do need to get a lot more data so we can really look at all these different saddle designs, given the fact that there are so many. All right, so then just to summarize, again, we've talked a lot about some of the risks of cycling, but overall, there's certainly a huge benefit, so I don't want to dissuade anybody from cycling. certainly very fun. Um, <clears throat> again, saddle fit position are very important. Uh, ideally, all the weight is going to be distributed on the ischial tuberosities on our sit bones. And then finally, I guess it's just the warning is that numbness may reflect future is issues, so not necessarily something to just ignore and push through. So at that Thank you. And Roger and I are happy to answer some questions for the next few minutes. So the question is, um, where should the, fa the saddle be? Should it be flat or tilted one way or another? Basically, I, I agree with you that the saddle should be flat. If the, bike is f if, you if the bike is properly fitted to you, the saddle is going to be flat or up or down, maybe three degrees, but no more than that. If you, if you see people riding with their saddle in awkward positions, it's because the bike isn't fit to them. The main thing that's important is the, the relief in the middle of the saddle. The, the, the nose part is 
it's individual. It depends on where you ride. You really shouldn't be riding long periods of time on the nose because it's very narrow. And so that will compress your arteries. So um, yeah, try not to be too far forward for too long. And make sure that when you ride, you get up and down so that you get the blood flow back. If you're riding on the nose for prolonged periods of time, you're gonna have problems. Here's the problem. The problem is that all of those three companies that you're talking about uh, went out to outside doctors for endorsements. Those doctors were not designing saddles. They were endorsing Cella San Marco, Cella Royale, Cella Italia. Um, to my knowledge, I'm the only doctor that was ever designing saddles. Uh, the other guys um, hired people to basically endorse their products. Now, there were other, other saddle manufacturers that went to Frank Summer's lab in Germany to measure blood flow. So ISM uh, and some of the Italian saddles went, went up there, but they measured the blood flow after they did the design. They didn't, they didn't alter the design in order to get better blood flow. So we've seen, we've seen women that can ride on anything and not have problems, or we've seen the opposite, where anything they ride on is a problem. The Brooks saddle is it's pretty good in the upright position. As long as you're not going in, into an arrow position, that saddle's probably pretty good. The newer Brooks saddles, some of them have relief systems, but the older ones, as long as you stay upright, you're okay. Uh, and of course, you've been riding this thing a long time and it's broken in. Uh, everybody always complained that in the beginning they were uncomfortable, but once you break them in and if you stay upright, you're probably okay. It doesn't really make much difference. Uh, so when you take the center relief out of the saddle, you're putting more pressure on your sit bones. And so then it's very important to have padded shorts, decently padded shorts. Uh, in the old days when the saddle was dome shaped and you were riding on your crotch, there was less pressure on your sit bones maybe it wasn't so important. But certainly with these newer saddles and the relief systems, you've got to have decent shorts. And Michael's better to, to answer this. From my experience, sometimes on, on certain dome-shaped saddles, the PSA can go up, but it, it never had any correlation with cancer. Mike? Yeah, I think the data on that threat, it's pretty mixed. I think in general, probably not. Maybe for some larger prostates with the pressure there, it can slightly increase it. So some studies have supported that. But in general, it's not, it shouldn't have a big role. You're asking how uh, the dropped handlebars came into being, and uh, this, cycling, cycling is a very traditional sport, and it comes from road, road racing. Uh, the aero position came um, because of, of the concept that the aerodynamics would be improved and that rider would be faster. What we learned uh, later with fit systems, and Andy Pruitt did this when he was at uh, one, of the, uh, one of the team camps. He actually raised the, the bars on many of the bikes, and they measured the aerodynamics, and it was better because the head position and different other variables that they weren't looking at. So um, in the beginning, like with Greg LeMond and all those guys were very, very um, aero. Uh, that's not the way it is today. Today, the riders are much more upright. And the spin situation is a little bit different. Than, than riding out on the road. Um, and the equipment's different, the shoes are different. Um, yeah, I don't know much about that. Yeah, but there's still a lot of numbness. A lot of numbness, and maybe even more. So they make the saddle wider, they pad it more, yeah. and it's going to help. That's not going to help. Yeah. It doesn't help. No, that's not going to help. Well, no, that, that uh, specific uh, exercise would, would require a different design. Um, but yeah, you're basically sitting flatter on the saddle. You're not getting up and down as much as you would on the road. The bumps on the road are, are, are forcing you to go up and down and relieve your pressure. You're not getting that in the spin classes. Yeah, there's a lot of differences. Uh, back, yeah? What about mountain biking? So mountain biking in some ways is better, in some ways isn't. Um, it's, it's better in that, in that you're not, you don't have constant pressure like for a long road ride that you would have. And all of these studies that we were talking about were long road ride, uh, rides, um, 15 hours, and uh, they created constant pressure problems and erectile dysfunction because of it. Mountain bikers don't have that, but they get slammed on the top tube and on their saddle. And top tube injuries, Erwin Goldstein was one of the first pe people to actually study that, but yeah, top tube injuries can destroy you. So uh, mountain bike biking's got its own set of problems. A little bit different. Yeah, if you're, as you get older, I, I mean, I think you have to accept the fact that if you're mountain biking, you are going to fall. Everybody does. So you have to decide when you want to stop falling. 
Well, so the, the issue with noseless saddles, this is an issue with noseless saddles. And um, the good part is that there's no pressure up front. The bad part is it's pretty damn hard to steer the bike. And so noseless saddles have never really made it in the industry. But what we did learn from um, the studies with noseless saddles is that the saddle didn't need to be so long. So if you guys know about the um, specialized power saddle, power saddle is two and a half centimeters shorter than a normal saddle. And it created a wave in the industry to make shorter saddles. Now everybody is making saddles that have a shorter nose on them. Uh, I, don't, I, I never did like the... Um, the saddles that just had the rear pads, I thought they were pretty unstable, and, and we always got a lot of complaints from riders. I guess it would depend on your riding style. The only way you're going to find the right saddle is to actually test the saddles out and ride them. You've got your own anatomy, and it's not just the bones, it's not just the pelvis, it's everything. And so, and it's your riding style and your bike. You need to see what works for you. There is, that's why you can't order this stuff over the internet, because you're not going to know what you're going to get. Uh, you need to you need to feel it. That's my opinion. I mean, I, I know a lot of people are trying to to change to internet driven sales with all sorts of computer algorithms. Uh, I'm just not convinced that's going to work. There are talented fitters all over the place. I mean, I worked with Specialized for 20 years, and we developed there with Andy Pruitt, the biggest international fit system in the world. And now it's, it's going uh, in a different direction. It's going to retool, which is a computerized um, stationary bike, and it's a little bit more consistent. I don't know the other systems, but, but I think that these guys have done their homework, and it's a good place to start. If you get fitted and you're not comfortable on your bike, don't believe that fit. Keep working on it until you get the right feel. It, it all depends on how you feel on your bike. The fit starts with the saddle, though. So um, you have to be on the saddle first, and then they fit the bike around it. All right, and that's part of the fit process, is to measure your flexibility in your hamstrings. And uh, on the basis of that, they'll set up the bike. As to whether, yeah, it would, be, it would be helpful to be more flexible, but you really don't need that, I don't think, because if, you get, if you're in a real fit system, they're going to adjust for your own limitations. I think we've, we need to stop here. Um, Thank you very much. Please fill out the study and make all your friends fill it out too. And good luck on your mountain bike. <laughs>